Okay, I guess we'll get started. I think that's everybody out of the waiting room. We don't have a faculty host for today, so I will be uh, introducing the speakers this morning. Um, we have two excellent speakers lined up for today. First, we'll be hearing about the work of Hiroshan Gunawarde, I think. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he received uh, his Bachelor of Technology Honours in Engineering uh, in the area of Mechatronics from the Open University of Sri Lanka and the Master of Applied Science degree from UBC. And he's currently pursuing his PhD degree in Mechanical Engineering with, uh, in the Department of Mechanical Engineering here. He received an Engineering Excellence Award in Sri Lanka in 2018 and the Friedman Award for Scholars in, Scholars in Health in 2020 from UBC. His talk today will cover his Master of Applied Science thesis work that he did in the Micro Electromechanical Systems Laboratory at the uh, University of British Columbia under the supervision of Miu Chow. All right, take it away here, Jan. Cool, thank you very much. I will stop my sharing. We did it all right, perfect. Um, can you see my screen? Yes, we can. Cool. Okay. So this presentation is going to be about my master thesis. So um, the title would be Model-Based Power Signal um, Processing for Measurement Techniques for Corneal Retinal Potentials. So in this presentation, I'll be talking about human eyes, extraocular muscles, and eye movements, corneal retinal potentials and saccades, eye tracking techniques, electroculography, and uh, model-based fusion techniques for EOG, uh, close eye and open eye studies, which are the human trials um, we have been running in psychology department, and um, EOG for virtual reality applications and some other future applications of our work. So to start with, um, we can say the most studied body part in the human body is human eyes. So studying eye anatomy, physiology, and movements are important to surgical planning, sleep disorder monitoring, psychological studies, and realistic animations and simulations. So um, there are a few applications of EOG and other eye tracking techniques. To start with, you can see in the figure one, uh, people, uh, people has used sleep disorder monitoring uh, for eye, tra eye, eye tracking has been used in sleep disorder monitoring. You can see this person wearing uh, electrodes around his face while he's sleeping. This data is uh, later used to diagnose sleep disorders. In some other applications, uh, they have used human machine interfaces like human computer interfaces. So as you can see in this example, this person is wearing a spectacle with um, ele electrodes. So they track the eye movements, and these eye movements are later used to control devices such as uh, wheelchairs and computers. So in this uh, work, uh, normally they are focusing applications such as uh, assistive devices for um, diseases with uh, the people with diseases with uh, like um, neurodegenerative diseases. And one of another application is uh, uh, creating organic eye movements in computer animations you know that we have to make realistic eye movements in uh, computer simulations therefore uh, um, human eye models have been used in uh, such scenarios our main uh, application of this work is realistic um, uh, virtual reality applications you can see uh, this video will show you uh, one of the main issue which is the cyber sickness and eye fatigue in uh, virtual reality you can see this person is playing this game with a virtual reality headset uh, on and then he has to move his eyes around uh, here and there to look around in his uh, virtual world but because of we have only um, eye movements I, I mean we have only head movements in traditional virtual reality devices we can have uh, we have to like move our heads here and there to um, look around so this is one of the uh, key issue that we think creates cyber sickness um sorry about that and so in here you can see this person is passing this car and then he has to look into the back mirror to see whether the other car is coming behind so every time he wants to look at that mirror the, he has to move his head we think that that is one of the reason behind this cyber sickness and eye fatigue. So we think uh, maybe lowering the accelerometer sensitivity and introducing eye tracking would be helpful to uh, mitigate cyber sickness and eye fatigue in virtual reality applications. Therefore, thinking of that, we are now 
weeks away from developing this um, i mean finally fin we are uh, finalizing this uh, prototype of the uh, virtual reality headset we have uh, attached a uh, few electrodes in the foam pad support of the virtual reality device and with this device we are uh, introducing eye tracking to the VR headset and also we have our own circuits and model-based fusion algorithm to fast and clean detection of eye movements in the virtual reality world. And also this headset will be able to modifiable for application required close eye movements. And to start with, uh, eye tracking is being used for a while in, the, uh, in, in many applications as I mentioned before. So, uh, there are different techniques of eye tech, uh, tracking uh, mechanisms. You can see the first one is EOG, where you will have to wear electrodes around your eye pole. And the second one is IROG, infrared oculography. You can use um, infrared signals to um, uh, detect the um, reflection of the cornea. And the third one is the scalar coil, where you will have to use um, a coil inside your eye and you will be placing your eye or you, you will be placing your head in a magnetic field. Once you are moving your eye, you will be uh, recording a proportional eye movements coming out from the signal. And also the last one is very popular. Those are camera-based systems. So you can use high-speed cameras to detect uh, eye movements. So if you compare these different techniques against EOG, EOG has very inferior features in, in spatial resolution, uh, temporal resolution, and also EOG can measure torsional eye movements and its setup time is very high but there are advantages of eeg as well that one of the advantage is it's, it has a linear fit and calibration and it's non-invasive and it's uh, it has no eyesight disturbance for example if you're using a camera you will have uh, some sort of uh, disturbance in front of your eye but if you're using eog you won't have it and also most importantly this is the only technique that you can use to uh, measure close eye movements. So uh, I think we should know what is eye anatomy to go forward about this uh, talk. So uh, in, in, in human eye, you will have six, six extraocular muscles around the eye pole, which starts from annulus fin and it goes to insertion. So you will have lateral rectus, inferior oblique, superior rectus, medial rectus, superior oblique, and muscles around the eye pole. So you will be generating different forces to move your eye when you want to look around so most importantly in 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 human eye you will have a positive charge in the front side of your eye which is in the cornea and you will have a negative charge in the uh, back side of the eyeball so we will be using this corneal potential in our work to uh, detect uh, eye movements so what happens here is you will place an electrode next to your eye. So when you are not moving your eye at all, meaning that you, when you have your eye in your resting position, you, don't have a, you, you are not going to get a signal at all. But when you are moving your eye away from the electrode, you will get a negative signal. And when you are moving your eye towards your uh, electrode, you will get a positive signal. So there are different types of eye movements you are using every day when you are looking here and there and doing various stuff. But among them, saccades are very important. And saccade, uh, saccade is when you are looking at a point, say point A in this picture, and when you are moving your eye from point A to point B without, move, without uh, considering the background, we call it a saccade. So you are making millions of saccade every day. And we are interested in saccades. Saccades are mainly used for diagnose different medical disorders. And also, it's important for virtual reality applications. This is an example of a traditional EOG setup, you can see this person is wearing electrodes. He has his reference electrode in the earlobe and he has his uh, uh, right eye electrode in the outer canthus. And then when he's blinking and moving his eye from left to right, you can see there is a signal coming out from the electrode that you can measure, which is proportionate to the eye movement. You can see he's moving his eye and he's blinking and these blinks and different eye movements are in the signal. So this is basically we are measured in the corneal retinal potential. So one of the key issue in recording their signals is this is typically record raw signal which we get from that setup. Uh, 
this sickness has uh, DC traits and it has blinks. You can see a blink that has um, corrupted one of the saccades. The saccad is this, actually, this is of interested information. So we are interested in extracting saccadic eye information from pro signals. But if you have a blink, you can do it. And also you will have EEG, EMG, and other, many other noise artifacts due to different uh, issues. So we can model actually this signal in terms of, um, let's say ET is the voltage recorded in the electrode. So it is equal to the corneal retinal potential plus artifacts and noise. So we are here interested in extracting the corneal retinal potential because corneal retinal potential is proportionate to the magnetic magnitude of the saccade. So it's linearly proportionate. So we have to extract uh, EET by taking out artifacts and noises from the voltage recorded in the electrode. So normally people are using bandpass filters. Normally they're using 0 to 35 hertz bandpass filters and notch filters and smoothing filters to do this. But we have seen, if you can go through our paper, we have published last year in sensors. So it has excessive filtering. So you are losing features. The filter is non-adaptive and it has a high computation cost and it's hard to implement in real time applications. And also it cannot restore missing features. So once you have missed, or once you have a, a, an issue with a saccade, saccade in a feature, you can't restore using uh, normal filters. So in order to um, uh, overcome these problems, we thought of having a model-based system uh, to uh, fuse with the EOG signal. But in here, we actually, in the literature, we found like four techniques of uh, model-based systems. Uh, I mean, modeling of eye, uh, human eye. Uh, there are like four different techniques they can use, they are, they are used to model human eye. The first one is geometrical model. So in the geometrical models, you use numerical techniques, but it, it has a very high computation cost and it's not suitable for filter applications. And also uh, there are electrical models. People have used Coulomb law to model the corneo retinal potential, which is highly accurate, but again, it has a high computation cost and not suitable for uh, filter applications. I'm not going to explain these techniques because this is not our today's focus, but if you are interested, you can go through our papers we have published in EMBC last year. Um, so, um, we have uh, actually worked on hypothetical models and the mechanical models. The hypothetical models are uh, you hypothesize to fit a particular particular eye movement. For example, you can say it has a constant velocity or a constant acceleration. And then we have fused these models with our measurement signals. And we found that it has a very low computation cost, but it again cannot improve missing or contaminated features. So the best ones are the mechanical models. You you use lamp parameter modeling like stiffness elements and damping elements to model human eye movements, which has a low computation cost and also can improve uh, missing and contaminated features. But again, it has an issue because it has, it can't actually, uh, I mean, you can't use single parameter for all of these models because it depends on the person. So you have to uh, use parametric estimation every time you use this model to from different person to person. And also it's not yet developed for real time applications. But in summary, you should know for good filter applications, you can use hypothetical models for real time applications and mechanical models for off offline applications. So uh, from here on, I'll be focusing only on mechanical models because we have a lot of uh, models to talk about and systems, but we have only a very limited time. Uh, we have been mainly focusing on two different um, mechanical models, which are uh, Vesemir and linear reciprocal model. In Vesemir model, what we do is like, we have the human eye with all six extraocular muscles, and then we are, um, I think, am I sharing the wrong screen, Carmen? Uh, no, we can see your screen. Uh, the presentation? Yeah. Okay. So, so um, we actually um, modeled this is ex six extraocular muscles, and then we uh, lumped into uh, one stiffness element and one damping element. 
And then you can see once you resolve this particular system, you can end up getting this second order differential equation. And then the state specific presentation we have used to uh, used in our simulation of uh, human eye models and the fusion work I'm going to explain in next slide. And one of the key disadvantages in this type of modeling is we can have only one single input. So you can't have, uh, you can't have flexibility over controlling the, these different, different extraocular muscles to control eye movements. So by considering that, we also use another model called linear reciprocal model. In this model, we model the uh, lateral rectus and the media rectus to generate horizontal eye movements where you have two muscle models developed separately, and then you separately innovate each of these muscles to control the eye movement. So this is actually a fourth order differential equation if you solve this system. And then we actually build this system in our uh, algorithm. So again, uh, I mentioned before, so we have two muscles here. So we have to separately innovate these two muscles in such a fashion to generate eye movements. So we actually uh, found in papers that there are different uh, recordings of uh, eye movement. If you, if you had a look into the blue color signal, the blue color signal is a real innovation coming from the brain. So you get this blue signal from your brain to your eye muscle in order to move your um, eye. So we model it as a step, pulse step input uh, in this fashion where we have, uh, we have implemented this pulse step input in our mathematical model here. I can show you as the input to the, uh, the, the model. And then we control our eye movement in a such a fashion where you can get a realistic saccade out of it. So this is a basic overlay of the uh, model-based fusion approach. What happens here is you will have a visual cue or an auditory cue for saccade in, in, in initiation. For example, when you are looking at somewhere, you have to like get a visual cue or an auditory cue to start your saccade with. So this saccade will innovate the neural model and we will have uh, either resumium model or, a lin or the linear reciprocal model inside the, uh, the, 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 the model. And then we estimate the states of the eye movements uh, according to the neural innovation we are getting. And also we will have the physical system, which is the real human eye. So you will get these visual cues and your brain will work somehow. I mean, your neurons will fire and then you will control your eyes accordingly. We will have our EOG system there. We will place an electrode and then we will do the measurement to record their signal. So now we have the estimation and the measurement. We are going to use Kalman filter to estimate the saccade. So so we actually ran uh, several uh, human subjects in the Department of Psychology. This is a picture from the vision lab. So we set up an experiment using an LCD with different uh, saccades on it. Uh, and then the person, the, the gold standard we have used in this application is iLink 1000 tracker, which is a uh, infrared based uh, high speed eye tracker. And we compare these eye tracking signals with our open BCI based uh, fusion algorithm with, that we have developed. So the experimentation is we distinguish um, four different saccades on the screen, A, B, C, D, starting from left, minus 22 to uh, plus 22. And then we record it using EOG and the eye link tracker, same time. And then this is uh, in figure 15B, you can see a typical recording of such signal where you can have a uh, distinguishable uh, nature or distinguishable signal for different sizes of the saccade. For example, this is a D, C, this is B and A. So the experimentation setup is like you will have a visual cue and an auditory cue where you will be triggering the test subject. So once the test subject is triggered by these markers and sounds, and then that then the 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 EOG device attached to his face and uh, the eye link tracker that is front of him will track the signals and then we we have used um, a software called Lab Recorder to sim simultaneously record this open PCI or EOG signals and eye link uh, thousand tracker signals. So the trial description is uh, what happens is you will have to press this press a key in the computer, uh, which is the space for this one. 
and then you will initiate then you will randomly generate you will you will get a random generation of the auditory cue and a visual cue this example for this example say it's a so you will hear a and you will see a point on the screen so you will have to fix it on this point in the screen and then you will have to wait until you hear a ping and then you will be again display the initial point you can come back so so you will hear a you move your eye to your A point, and then you wait there, and then you come back. So we have done this experimentation for A, B, C, D in a in a in a in a um, predefined manner and a random order. So this example actually show we have uh, done several setup of several experimentations for calibration. For this is actually a one trial which is three, 30 minutes long. So you make tens of a's tens of b's tens of c's and tens of d's and then after that you go to the experimentation and you make random saccades out of it so we have recorded this is uh, the, the blue color lines are uh, the video equilography or uh, the island thousand tracker and then the latter part uh, the orange color signal is eog the electroculography signal and from these signals we have uh, we have actually study um, some parameters. The first parameter is the latency. The latency is the uh, the saccade initiation to the first change point, and then the saccade amplitude. Saccade amplitude is the, is basically the average of the peaks, the peak points of the saccade signal. And we also recorded or we also measured the saccade velocity for this application. So we ran uh, about like twenty participants, and we got. Um, like character signals as well. So we ended up having a 11 participant database. And from that database, we use uh, the outlier exclusion criteria to be 1.5 into IQR in the second magnitude. And then we have uh, calibrated uh, all these signals. So the calibration is basically linear regression. So we use linear regression to calibrate band pairs, Vesemir, and linear reciprocal, and we compare again I link. So table three actually shows you the calibration factors. Uh, you can see surprisingly the, the linear reciprocal model is giving a very close um, value to the I-link calibration factors, which is a good thing. I will uh, show you the other results in the next slide. So this is one study, one experimentation uh, for the for those um, eleven participants. Hi. So we can we only have a couple of minutes left. Are you nearing the end? You should wrap it up, I think. Yeah, so I'm, I'm closing. Great, thanks. So um, we will have, uh, we actually have uh, four different um, saccades coming out of from this uh, signal. And these are the band pairs, Vesemi and linear reciprocal, uh, uh, different algorithms. And uh, also we uh, compare it with the I-link where we got a good correlation, 7.4 to 7.5. And also the accuracies were very high, 43 and 48 with respect to band pairs for absolute values. And for relative values with I-Link, we got 25 and 43. And these are some examples of the signals that we got out from the experimentation. You can see um, the row signal and this, the, the green color one is the row signal, which is the messy one. And then the red color signal is actually the I-Link tracker. And then we apply the band pass filter. It kind of like improved a little bit. But when we apply model-based ones like Vesemir and linear reciprocal, we got it very improved. And also the linear reciprocal model is kind of giving us a very stable signal without many changes in the peaks. So we think this is the best, uh, uh, the model that you can use to improve features. And also these are other free, some examples. You can see these, are, these signals are very messy. But when you are comparing with band pass, linear reciprocal is giving in the middle, you can see the linear reciprocal filter. So it gives you a very good outcome. So here, these are, the, these are some summaries. You can see we found some nonlinearity in A, B, C, D uh, saccade points. A is a uh, little bit shaky when it compared with D. This is because of the nonlinearity error. I think we can modify the calibration to do that. Also, we got a 7.5 improvement in correlation. And we got recovered 28% and 33% 30, 30, 30, um, 
outlier recovered from leukemia and linear reciprocal and also these are the the accuracy improvements so in future we will be working on uh, improving these lamp parameter based techniques for real time applications and also we will be validating our headset prototype and we are planning to run some human subjects and studying to cyber sickness and eye fatigue and the new applications of this work will be we'll be focusing i mean we will be interested on uh, working on dizziness research and some entertainment applications of this vr device so we have uh, this is our research team and we are working on uh, in collaborations with department of psychology and um, industrial consultant and i would like to thank them and here are some publications and uh, thesis that we have uh, published out of this and i would like to thank ncerc for uh, sponsoring us for this project and also stanford uh, uh, neuromuscular biomechanics lab for simulation support and also from dr dinesh pai from cs and biotalent canada program and virtual and ubc program for uh, sponsoring the undergraduate students who are involved in this project and thank you very much for listening to me if you have any questions you can this, you can go ahead. Great, thank you. There are loads of questions in the chat, so I will get started. Okay, um, let's see. I'll try to, there's common themes among some of them. Um, what is the coordinate base for the system to analyze the movement? So in the case of strabismus, strabismus and other um, eye misalignments, how can you adapt the system? Well, um, right now we are not focusing on any um, eye disease like strabismus. This is only for like a person with a person who has a good um, um, eye movement or without any eye disorder. So the coordinate system is basically in the center of the eyeball for now. But with the strabismus, I think what happens in strabismus is you are, you are getting some issue in the the extracular muscles so you are getting a kind of like a misalignment when you are moving your eyes so you can focus on one point so i believe these models actually can somehow um, um focus on or maybe like modifiable to such applications but we haven't done something like that yet Okay, uh, and a couple of questions that are sort of related. Was the head fixed to isolate the effects of head movement during the experiments? And then sort of relatedly, can changes in facial expression or speaking interfere with your signals? Uh, I think you can see my screen. Uh, here you can see the experimentation setup. So we are using this uh, headrest in the eye link thousand tracker. So head is fixed with respect to the eye link tracker and we are asking from participants to move their, un I mean, not to do their unnecessary head and eye movements, uh, I mean, often when, when, when they are running the experiment. So that's one of the specific instructions that we are giving to them. So they shouldn't be like blinking too much. They can have their natural blinks, but not blink too much. So, I mean, if you have like too many blinks, then you will have a corrupted signal. Right. Um, someone was wondering if you could elaborate on eye fatigue and cyber sickness. Are these factors unique to um, VR applications? Yeah, one of the key challenge in um, cyber sickness is, I mean, in VR is cyber sickness, right? So what happens is when you are playing for like um, maybe half an hour, you get your head dizzy and you will have the dizziness and you even maybe like ending up maybe vomiting right so this is actually the key challenge that we are seeing in uh, vr and also the eye fatigue is because you are focusing into a point which is too close to you and you are pointing in you are pointing your eye into like maybe like a very low range of points for a long time i mean i think that's one of the reasons that we have eye fatigue so for the second one i mean i don't know what we can do with eye fatigue to be honest but uh the cyber sickness i think as i showed you in the video like uh, one of the main issue in um the, the one of the main issue we have seen actually in this application is you have to move your head a lot a lot than necessary because of you don't have eye movements. For example, when you pass this car and when you want to look into the back mirror, 
you have to have your head movements see uh rather moving your eyes to look into the mirror so once you uh, once we have the uh, eye movements in the vr we believe that it's going to reduce the um i i mean eye fatigue and cyber sickness not necessarily eye fatigue but maybe cyber sickness so some studies in virtual reality sickness suggest that women experience higher rates of motion sickness does your eye tracking investigation shed any light on this issue oh um that part actually we haven't think yet maybe that's one of the good suggestions we can have um um focused on i think right. yeah could your new analysis of saccadic eye movement be applied to diagnosis of concussion and post-concussion syndrome? I know that this movement is often impaired in concussions. Yeah, I think we can. We can. I don't know the relationship between the eye movements and the concussion. Um, like if there is such um, relationship, I think we can use the eye movement I mean, we can use this algorithm and the device to record the data, and then from there we can see whether there is a relation. Right. And one of the nice thing that we have found is um, in in Saint Paul's Hospital there is something called uh, Rotary Clinic. So they are there in there they are researching about the dizziness. So I think we are kind of like trying to focus our devices to their applications as well, where we can. Recorded the record the eye movements of the person who has diseases like vertigo, and then later predict the uh, vertigo or maybe like their level of the sickness uh, using these eye movement recordings. Right. But that's in uh, research level. Right. So I think we'll just have one more, and this is kind of a synthesis that several people have asked uh, this question or variants of this. Could this work be applied in order to improve care in the field of optometry or ophthalmology? or towards creating and improving biomedical devices? Well, uh, that's actually a nice thing. Um, uh, if you remember the two um, model-based techniques that I mentioned uh, here, give me a second. So we are working on different eye movement models. So if you are using hypothetical models, those are good for real-time applications. and the mechanical models are good for offline applications. For example, if we are using for some sort of a medical application, such as diagnosing a disease, I believe you no need to have real-time data so you can record it, and then you can use this model-based uh, fusion technique to improve the uh, signals and see whether what their actual human eye behaviors are. So I think it can go both ways. Uh, it can be applied in both uh, applications, but right now it has to be different models that you should be selecting in your fusion-based application. Right. Okay, great. Thank you so much for the talk. That was uh, very interesting. We'll move on to our second speaker now.